open your Bibles with me again to Ephesians. I'm not going to read the whole thing this time. <clears throat> Sean Doby is disappointed about that, but we can't have everything. So, we're going to begin um, chapter 2. I'm going to read uh, beginning in verse 11 and then through chapter 3, verse 6. And before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for um, putting this thing together called the church with preaching and sacraments with water and bread and wine and singing and prayer and fellowship. Lord, it, it's, it, it should be amazing to the outside world and it should be amazing to us that we're being knit together. People from all different nationalities and backgrounds that have this one thing in common, at least, which is Jesus Christ reached in to our dark lives and saved us and has brought us into the church. So, Lord, we thank you. We look forward to learning more about this from Paul, by your Holy Spirit, this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, again, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, the word of the Lord. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So let me just, I didn't mean to interrupt the reading of the word of God, but just so you know, we're talking about Gentiles and Jews. So Gentiles in the flesh, that's where ethnoi, the nations, it's called goi or goim in the Old Testament. There's just um, any non-Jewish person. So in the Israel, in the Jewish way of looking at things, Jews and Gentiles. And Gentiles were unclean, hopeless, godless, separate, and you were you become unclean when you come into contact with them. And so Paul is announcing something rather amazing here. So at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were, once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father." So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Amen. The word of the Lord. So in chapter 2, in verse 1, you can recall and you can see right there that Paul said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world 
and that indeed you were children of um, the wrath of God. And so now Paul is saying that our condition there before faith came was that of deadness. But in verse 4, he says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So you were dead, but God in Christ Jesus made us alive. And so Paul shows us that that was our condition. And then in the second half of chapter 2, Paul shows us that as we were dead in our sins and children of God's wrath because of our sinful nature, now he shows us that we were separated from the covenants and promise of God Only the children of Abraham, the Jewish people, were God's chosen people. Heirs of the promise of righteousness by faith in God's promise. And they had the promise to to be a people, a promise to have a land, a promise to be a kingdom. No one in the New Testament or the Old Testament was ever saved without faith in God. Lack of faith in God in the garden is what got us all in this mess to start with. So don't believe that people in the Old Testament were saved by works of some sort and people in the New Testament are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ stands at the pinnacle of all that God is doing in the world from the foundation of the world. So that from the beginning, you're saved. Looking forward to the cross, Christ's blood cleanses those who have faith in the Messiah to come. And those, as we look back to the cross, are saved with that same faith, looking to Jesus Christ, his blood, and his sacrifice. It's faith in the promises of God, what saved us in the Old Testament and still saves us in the New Testament, where we have clearer light. In verse 12, we see, we were without hope and without God in the world, dead with no means of resurrection. So you can't resurrect yourself. You, you don't even try it, okay? There's, it's not, it's not going to work. But in verse 13, it says, And now in Christ Jesus, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you're dead in the first part of chapter 2, and now in, in the second part of chapter 2, you're, you're without any hope even. So yes, there is a possibility of resurrection. But you're so far removed from it that you don't, even, you don't even know about it. But God went and brought us near. And so this is the, the work of God in Christ Jesus. So verse 13, now in Christ Jesus, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, for he himself is our peace. And that's Paul speaking, so this is Jew and Gentile. This is, he is our peace, who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, made one. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he himself might create in himself, in Christ Jesus, one new man in place of the two, and so making peace. So this is very important covenant theology, biblical theology, that there's now in Christ, that's the people of God. Jew and Gentile, the people of God, one man. And so... Jews need to understand outside of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Gentiles need to understand that outside of Christ, there is no salvation. But in Christ, we are both, Jew and Gentile, made one as we become the church, as we are knit together, as Paul lays out very clearly for us here. Verse 15, one new man in place of the two. So not Jew and Gentile, now it's just God's one people, the church the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, one person, one people. And then in verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Remember, he said that was our problem. Now he's like, you're no longer strangers and aliens. In Christ, believers, those of you who have trusted in the gospel, who've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are no longer strangers and aliens. So now what Paul does is he's going to take us deeper into a relationship with God and with God's people that had been foreshadowed, it had been imagined before, as he says in um, chapter 2, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his kindness towards us, 
Jew and Gentile, all believers in Christ, in Christ Jesus. He's going to show us the immeasurable riches of his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's going to say, and let me show you what it is. Let me show you, give you a glimpse into what this immeasurable richness of his kindness is. So then back to 2.19, he says, so then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, so what are you? You've been changed, you've been transformed, you are not what you were, you are now fellow citizens with the saints. It's just interesting, he uses the word saints, because we think of that as a New Testament church word, but he's talking about with all the believers from the Old Testament. They were, they were the set-apart ones, the hagias, the holy ones, and so now anybody who comes into Christ are in the, in the church. And so we are made one with this. But we become fellow citizens. So it's not just citizens, but fellow citizens. And one of the things we're going to see as Paul is, is breaking this down more, so what it means, especially for Gentiles, but also for Jews to come to Christ, to come to faith in Christ, is this amazing relationship that we have with God, but also this also mystical union we have with one another in Christ. Not just Jews and Gentiles. Who, and he's making a big deal about that because it's like <laughs> it's unimaginable. Although it was foreshadowed and foretold that the Gentiles would be blessed in Abraham. That there would be a coming of the nations to God. But now it's like, it's just, you ain't seen nothing yet. He's like, it, Paul is bursting open the expectations that anybody had of what was going to happen. And so, and we see why it's difficult for some of the Jewish people to, to have trouble with this, but they examined the scriptures, and those who had faith were like, it has to be so. And they're called by faith, drawn by the Holy Spirit, just as Gentile believers ourselves are. But then there's this union that takes place between Jew and Gentile, but not just between Jew and Gentile, between every, between Jews and Jews and Gentiles and Gentiles as well. Believers, this, this we call it this mystic sweet communion with believers, and so this is something that God is working in our midst as well. So fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. And this is where God in Christ Jesus rules, protects his people. He's our servant shepherd king. So if you're kind of a note taker, then one of the things is the kingdom is where God rules. And this is where we've been brought in. The citizenship into this um, community is, is a kingdom because it's ruled by Christ Jesus and so the kingdom is where God rules. Our highest citizenship is in the kingdom of God. So while we seek as best we can to honor earthly kings, King Jesus is above all earthly powers. And so we see that clearly in Scripture. So as believers, we are now no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens together, all of us as believers in the kingdom of God. But it goes amazingly deeper still because as Paul now reveals a part of what we saw in chapter 1 verse 5 when he says that we've been predestined for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So now in 219 we go beyond mere citizenship. We're not just subjects of a king but the throne is a throne of grace on which sits our loving Heavenly Father. So it's one thing to be a subject in the kingdom. It's another to be the son of the Most High God who is the king sitting on the throne. And so he's bringing us deeper into this relationship. So he says here, it's not just us, but all believers in Christ, Jew and Gentile, fellow members of the household of God. So you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So Members of the household, sometimes you just got to do the Greek. Members of the household, that's one word in, in Greek. Um, and this is one of those words that we've talked about a good bit. This word is called oikeoi. Oikeoi, this sounds kind of good. It's the word um, oikos, which is the Greek yogurt that you get at the grocery store. Oikos, it means family, it means house, it means home. And so I don't know if that's why they named the it or that or it or not, but this is, you are family. The word means that. So it's a, you do a word study, and you look at the word family, and you see what the Greek words are. Um, it's typically this oikos, this house, the household, the, the family. So you are members of the household. You are households of God. You are family. When Rob and I went to General Assembly last time, we went to this restaurant, and um, everybody in there was real loud and stuff because they're all PCA 
elders and stuff, and the woman comes out, and she says, family, family, and I don't know if she says it to everybody or not, but it was like, and everybody got quiet, and she said, order 17, you know, because nobody could hear the orders being called, I just thought, that's so cool, so yelling out family, because that's what we are, family, and so I don't know exactly what all she implied by it, but I felt like she was saying, hey, I'm a believer too, he's nodding his head, you think I'm right on this, yeah, she's like, hey, didn't call us brothers and sisters, she said family. And it's a good way it's for, we need to think of ourselves, not just certainly within this church, but within the church. We are family. And you don't get to pick and choose your family. If you adopt somebody, you get to pick and choose them, but you don't get to choose who your brothers and sisters are. So when you're adopted, you're brought into the family. And if your, family, your parents adopt somebody else, then they're your family too. And so we have to learn to love one another and, and, and God is making a a big point with this. You are family of God. The stress seems to be on the idea of brotherhood rather than, rather than on sonship right here. So again, it's, it's true. You've been adopted. That means you got God's your father, but it also means there's brotherhood. There's family relationships that begin to take place and that our closeness to all other believers is greater because we've been adopted into the same family. Our sonship produces brotherhood. Male or female, it's the same word, this brotherhood, this family. So if you ever begin to feel as if everything is just falling apart around you, I know none of you ever feel that way, but like everything is just spinning out of control. You have to remember that God, the King, Jesus, is in control. The kingdom is where God rules. You are in the kingdom of God. You are fellow citizens. And he is ruling. God is in control. And he really is at work in all things for the good of his people and for his own glory. And when you begin to feel alone in this world, when you begin to feel a little lost, look around at the church, the family of God of which we are all members by God's grace. This family is where God indwells. So the kingdom is where God rules, but the family, the church here, in this sense, is where God indwells each individual person, and we're all being indwelt together. So the kingdom is where God rules, the family, the household of God is where God indwells, all the members forming us all into one body so that we encourage and strengthen one another and serve one another all the more as we see the day approaching. But next he begins to play off this word household, where it looks like, you know, what it really is, is a house, a physical building. So if you look in verse 20, he says, um, we're members of the house of God, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles. All right, so he's using his metaphorical language, this is real. So a house is built on, he tells a story about the wise man built his house on the rock. You know, the, the foolish man built his house on the sand. So you, with this foundation for the household of God, for the church, is the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. So let's just look at this household idea first. So this built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets so there's a lot of, you know, what do you mean by prophets? We get apostles, but prophets. Is that Old Testament prophets? And the thinking is probably not because they would probably would have said prophets and apostles, but could be because that's a part of it. But the apostles and prophets seem to be, as I'm studying this, it's like Luke was not an apostle, but he could have been considered a prophet. So there were forth tellers that had divine inspiration that in the early church were foundational to its growth. But it had to be based on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. So the foundation is the New Testament scriptures that we have now. And so there's a saying, I can't remember who said it, but the New Testament was concealed in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is now revealed in the New. And so what the New Testament writers have done, what the Holy Spirit has done is saying, like, let me now show you how to read and see what has been put there the whole time. And we're going to see this more when we talk about the word uh, mystery for Paul because 
the church is not a New Testament creation. It's, it's, it's been there from the garden. And so the Old Testament is revealed in the New. Verse 21, being joined together by this chief cornerstone. Now the King James says, being fitly framed. And so the idea is you have this big cornerstone, and a cornerstone does several things, and it's all an analogy here, but one of the things it does is it joins um, two walls together. So if you've got Jews and Gentiles, then this cornerstone is fitting them together. It also acts as a, as a, a plumb line of sorts where it keeps everything straight. So Jesus Christ is going to keep everything straight and everything fitted together. So whatever God is doing in his church, he is the foundation, as we're going to see at the, at the apostles and prophets. He's also their foundation. So if the apostles and prophets go anywhere else for information, then we don't have to follow them. As a matter of fact, it says in um, Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Did you were able to get that on the screen? So Paul is saying Jesus himself is the foundation um, because Jesus is the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So when you read what Paul says in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, but even if we, one of the apostles, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This is happening all over the place now, okay? Churches, calling themselves churches. Pe preachers, calling themselves preachers. Preaching a gospel completely contrary. I mean, you didn't have to look for somebody just didn't quite getting it right. I mean, it's just blatantly, it's the grace of God that, so I know he's not quite through with us yet because he hadn't struck, struck us all down with these things. But it says, let that person be accursed. And that means a person doomed to destruction, devoted to destruction. You don't mess with the gospel. It's the foundation of the church. And so even if an apostle or a prophet preaches another gospel, let them be accursed. An angel from heaven, let him be accursed. And see how many different religions claim to have their different gospel delivered from angels. Let them be accursed. Accursed. But here's what's happening in Christ's church, which is being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Not a pope, not a council, not a tradition, not the imaginations of men, but on the Bible with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Look what it does in Christ. It grows. It grows. That's kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever built a house before, but you know, they don't just grow. I mean, they, they kind of do sometimes. I've seen some houses where it's like, you know, there's been a lot of additions out of that house. I don't know what happened. You know, all of a sudden, they got this and this and this and this. You know, it's grown. But it's a little bit different here because what he's saying is the way this house can grow is because it's a spiritual house. It is made up of living stones. This temple for God, you don't go anywhere in the world and somebody will say to you, where is the temple for your God? And it's like, well, it's not in Mecca, it's not in Jerusalem, it's not in, you know, wherever you think it might be, it's not this building. You know, where is the temple for your God? Where's the place in the world that represents the church? And so you have to be able to say, and hope you know the answer, it's like, you just said it, it's the church. We're the church, we're the temple all over the world, and it's growing. And so, <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, it's like, are we, do we see it growing? How does a building grow? When it's an organic body, the church, the people of God's own choosing, the faithful in Christ, being rightly fitted and framed together, it grows. It's growing into something. And it's growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in verse 22. So the, the kingdom is where God rules. The, the body, the family, is where God indwells. But the temple is where God lives in a, in a different way. They're all kind of, they match up, but it's like there, is, there are nuances to this thing. So it's where God lives amongst his people, being in us to love one another, but also being among us as we might together come to him and love and worship him. So, so here's a great question, one that gets asked a lot. How do we grow the church? How do you grow the church? I'm sure I have a book, I think it's a green book, appropriately, How to Grow the Church. 
you know, lots of books. How do you grow the church? How do we grow the church? How do you grow the church? I mean, it's probably if you, anyway, you get my point. Lots of books on how to grow the church. So I'm going to give you the quick answer on how to grow the church because I obviously know the secret. So here's the secret to how you grow the church. How do we grow the church? We don't. The Spirit does that. Look at verse 22 again. In Him, in Christ Jesus, you also are being built together. I'm going to skip to what it says, by the Spirit. You're being built together by the Spirit into a dwelling place for God. You are being built. This is a, it's called a, a middle passive. You are being built. You aren't building away quickly and trying to build the church. and trying to, Now, there are things to do. Don't, don't let me lose you and go, but there's certainly something. Yeah, 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 there's stuff to do. But it's the Spirit that's doing it. So this is very important. <clears throat> and so the way we do it is by driving our roots downward that we might bear fruit upward. How do you do that? How does a seed? It's like, come on, seed. You know, I read something the other day. It's like, is it okay to pray for your medicine to work? It's just coincidental. I happen to, you know, Google's always listening. And it's like, is it okay to pray for your medicine to work? Which is interesting. It's like, well, you pray for a seed to grow. So, yeah, you want to pray for these things that God has put um, in the world for God to make these things work in the way that he's intended for them to. If you're a farmer and you depend, you know, watch a Little House on the Prairie if you're, if you're too young and you don't know how these things work. I mean, these guys were plant stuff, and it's like, if they didn't make it, I don't know what you do. So they're very dependent on the providence of God, very dependent on one another. And so um, how do we drive roots downward? The house we are grows, and therefore God is not only the architect, but he is the gardener. And so he's our architect, but he's also our gardener. Now, I, Amy has held, I won't blame this on Amy. We have planted gardens in the back of our house. Jalapenos did a really good one year. Miss Ruby showed me how to grow tomatoes, and it's like, God bless her. I know she knows what she's talking about, but it just, I see hers, but mine didn't look the same. But this guy next door to us is a master gardener. We get, I don't, I shouldn't tell y'all this, but it's like, we haven't bought like lettuce or anything in like forever. Like kale, we have these awesome, it's like, I'm, Amy's like, I'm gonna go cut some salad. It just sounds like we're living in hippie times or something. I'm, she go out there cutting salad out of the garden. It's, and it's amazing. It's not like icebergs, so you can taste it. And it's good for you. And so that guy, come to my house. And people say, oh, is that your garden? And I'm like, you don't know me, do you? <laughs> it's like, that's a garden. So imagine God's the gardener. He accomplishes what he's going to accomplish. He tills the soil. And he's the one that causes roots to go deeper. Sometimes roots are driven deeper when there's a drought. Now, I can be wrong about that because I'm not a good gardener. But I'm sure that sometimes it's reaching for, I need more water, I need more water. And so sometimes when we're in times of drought, spiritual drought, that's when he's doing more that you can't see underneath the surface so that one day there is fruit that comes about. So we are his house. He's the architect. He's our gardener, gardening spiritual, physical, thinking, beings, and then the all things working together. He is preparing the soil. He's driving our roots deep, and he is... Um, always at work in us. And so if you look at verse 3, I mean, sorry, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, he says, so that in Christ, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend these things. So we've been talking a lot in this church, we've clung to this verse, I think it's in Isaiah, that says, you know, Bearing, driving roots downward to bear fruit upward. And so here in Ephesians, to grow the church, what he's doing is you've been rooted and grounded in love. So that's where our, our roots are, our grounding is in love. Love is a very important thing in the church, if you haven't picked up on that. God is love. Love is the summation of the moral law and the prophets. If you have not love, Paul says, you're a clanging symbol. Just a noisy gong without love. No matter what you do, 
if it's done without love, it's worthless. Worse than worthless. It causes people to stop up their ears. So, in trying to grow the church, we do have work to do in the Spirit. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. So there's stuff to do. But God prepared these things beforehand that we should walk in them. So we walk in His paths, doing the, the good works which He has prepared. But no matter what we do to grow the church, we must never build on another foundation. You never build the church on something other than Jesus Christ and Him as the cornerstone. So turn Briefly with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's just a few pages back toward the beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I'm just going to read these seven verses here. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So he's talking about growing the gospel, preaching the gospel. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with the word of God. We're built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. If you're going to go to the church and you start tampering with the word of God to do that, you, you're accursed. That's, that's, no, you cannot do that. You have to stand firmly on the gospel and everything it teaches. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Even if our gospel is veiled, people can't see it. They don't seem to be catching it. You know, what's the problem? Well, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world's blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, so we can't be proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. We ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, for God said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So when we look at our efforts to grow the church and it falls short, our efforts to grow the church and we keep stumbling, we keep kicking each other, we keep doing whatever it is that we do, it's like, you know, I don't want to say it's okay, but it's okay because God's the one growing the church and what he's going to do is he's going to... Um, it's, it, we have, we're in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power is not from us. I mean, if you go to some church, it's like, man, they're awesome. So recently, there was the, the football player, sorry, I can't remember his name, that was the, the Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic football player speaking at a Roman Catholic school. Everybody's upset that he actually talked about Roman Catholic theology. It's like, <laughs> what do you want him to do? And um, so one of the things he said was, I'm not quoting exactly, but it was the sense of the reason a lot of people are returning to the Roman Catholic Church or doing certain liturgies in the church is because they want to have the depth of tradition. They want to have the, the, the meaning that's there. They want to see the, that, there's, that, there's, that there are, um, how did he put it? That there are, there's, just, there's deep meaning in these old things. And it's like, yeah, and I think he's right. But the problem with that is it's like they need to be coming because of Christ. You know, is Christ there? If we're going to go to church and we start saying, hey, look, we sing, I mean, who knew? I mean, there, we've got young people that have come here because we, because we sing hymns. It's like all of a sudden we go, hey, you know what? These young people are liking hymns. Let's start singing hymns again. You can't, you can't sing hymns to, because you think that's your church growth movement. You know, you sing hymns because you think we're supposed to sing hymns or we sing psalms. Why? Well, it's one of those old things. Man, you start singing psalms, that sets you out. People come and say, hey, that, that church sings psalms. Now, I did Taekwondo martial arts for a long time. <laughs> One of the things you get, it's funny, I, I wanted, to, there's got to be some little thing you can do between martial arts schools and churches because there's these weird little things. Two you know, martial arts instructors come together and they're like, hey, how's your, how's, your, how's your school doing? Oh, we're doing really good. How's yours doing? Oh, pretty good. Uh, how many students do you have? And he's like, I've got 500 students. And, and the other guy's like, oh, you're one of those schools. No, no, no. We, we've, we only have like 30. Um, we're, we're very strict. A lot of people just can't deal with it. You know, it's that kind of thing. So it's like, are you going to be big and open it up and just entertain people? Or are you real small? And it's like, we're just going to be real hard on people. And the idea being, it's like, it's still all about 
manipulation. And so we can't be about manipulation. It's like, how does God want to be worshipped? Um, how does God want to be proclaimed? It's just the gospel. If you're going to sing, sing the gospel. If you're going to pray, pray the gospel. If you're going to preach, preach the gospel. If you're going to open up a book and read from it and proclaim it, make it the Bible, and then make sure the Bible interprets the Bible, and stick. So anyway, it's, it, the, the, the Holy Spirit has said, I will bless the, the preaching and reading of my word. It will not return void. So that's what we do. We preach the gospel. And, and then he, he promises to bless the sacraments as well. So this is what we do. We make use of what we call the means of grace, the things that God has put into place to, to grow us. But we are in jars of clay. So the power is not from us, but we never tamper with the word of God. And then Paul moves to prayer. But he interprets himself, he interrupts himself as he tends to do. So when you get to verse chapter 3, he says, for this reason. And then he takes a little rabbit trail that's full of theology. And then he comes back to it in verse 14. For this reason, I bow the knee. So what we see here in chapter 3, beginning in, in verse 1, is for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles. So it's not of Caesar. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for us. So two places. First, look at Ephesians, since we're here, 4, and just begin looking at verse 11. So this is how, remember, we're talking about how the Holy Spirit grows the church. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's causing that to happen. Unless we resist the Holy Spirit and we don't repent of our sins and we don't love each other and forgive each other and show grace to one another and deference to each other and thinking more, other people more important than ourselves, that sort of thing. So what he's doing is he's, he's bringing us closer into relationship with himself and therefore growing the body as we grow when we build ourselves up in love. But if you look, as I pointed here, he's like, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ on your behalf. So if you look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, because I'm in prison. Well, not me, but Paul, Paul's like, I'm in prison. And I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really happened to serve to advance the gospel. He's growing the kingdom. That's why he's okay about being in prison. He's like, you know what it's done? Look at the body still, it grows. It grows. They took the apostle to the Gentiles and they locked him up. That'll take care of that. Satan wrings his hands and does his dastardly laugh. You know, what are you going to do in prison? Well, it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. It's like everybody in here is turning to Christ. They're all hearing the gospel. And, all, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, I don't quite understand that. It's like Paul got arrested. That made them more bold. That's the way we ought to be. That's the Holy Spirit. The church starts to look like it's being persecuted. Well, we get more bold. You know, some leader gets arrested, then everybody else becomes more bold. You see it in China. A lot of times they're persecuting the churches there, and some church leader gets arrested, you know, underground church, and he's arrested, and everybody else is just praying harder and proclaiming louder. So the Holy Spirit works through these things. Um, and they're all the more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul got arrested. Now they're more bold to speak without fear. You would think if Paul got away with it and not being arrested, then now they'd speak without fear, but it was the, the work of God 
that Paul is seeing is like, I've been arrested, but I want you to know this is served to advance the gospel. And so God is at work in all these things. And he says, I'm assuming you've heard of the stewardship of the gospel of grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So you probably know this. Mystery in Greek in the New Testament isn't like the type of a mystery like the, you know, the Scooby-Doo and the, the mystery machine. You've got to solve the mystery. You know, it's like, no, it was something hidden that was always there, but it's now been revealed by God. The only way you can know this thing that's in the Bible, that's in theology, that's there about God is if God reveals it. So he's now revealed it. And that's what a mystery is. I'm telling you this mystery. They, they heard of it a little bit, but now, so if you, if you look at what it says, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, God had to reveal it, as I have written briefly, probably talking about in this letter, when you, re, re, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So now it's like the revelation of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed by his holy prophets and prophets. So it was revealed. I mean, you could foresee Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, but not in this fullness. Paul's just like, here it is. Let me tell you about the revelation. Paul went through a tremendous transformation on the Emmaus Road that took him from being a persecutor of the church to knowing Christ Jesus is Lord. And it had to take place in the way in which it did to convince him that God is God and Jesus Christ is God and he needs to proclaim it to the nations that the Gentiles are now a part of the church. And he goes from persecuting the church to, to taking the gospel to the Gentiles. He says in verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, in Greek, it's, those are three words that start with the synonym sin, which means the same. We kind of use the word co, so it can be like they're co-heirs and members of the same body. He created a word. Paul likes to create words. It's like concorporate. So you've all one body, and it is, is one word. So we're fellow heirs, one body, and partakers together, co-partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, and we're almost done here. You go to Galatians chapter 3. It's right before Ephesians. Galatians 3, 29. I think this is one that's on the screen here. Um, and if you are Christ's, and if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. So he's making it clear here. You are heirs according to promise. That's all three things he just said uh, in Ephesians. And if you remember Ephesians, you were fellow heirs. And see what it says? You're heirs. He said, you are members of one body. You are Abraham's offspring. And you are heirs according to promise. You are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. So let's not miss Paul's glorious conclusion to Christ's church growth movement. It's not just bigger churches. It's not just more believers. But of a, a grand and beautiful and magnificent finish, it's our hope, the grand finale of church growth where it's all going to. So second, two places we're going. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. So... It's a good conclusion here. So we do not lose heart. Why would he say that? Because you tend to lose heart. I mean, yeah, growth is difficult. Growth hurts. Growth is not just like this. And it's even worse when he's like, you have growth. You know, it's like you're lifting weights or you're losing weight. <laughs> Whatever, with weight. You know, it's like you're doing good, you're doing good. And then you, ah. And it's like, oh, it can be, a lot of people just quit. And it's like, you can't quit then. You, you keep going, you keep plowing, you keep telling, you keep moving, you keep praying, you keep hoping, you keep trusting. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And this is wonderful, especially for elderly people stuck at home that, that 
see glory coming closer every day, as we all should be able to see. But the outer self is wasting away, but the inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. So we're being prepared. Remember, we're growing into something, an eternal weight of glory. A little play on words, the word glory kind of means weightiness in Hebrew. An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen. So you're looking for growth. Maybe you don't look to what's seen as much because the things that are seen are transient. They fade, they they go away quickly, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, that is, our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For we are still in this tent. While we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. It's my favorite verse to speak at a funeral. What is mortal is going to be swallowed up by life. So when you die, Christian, you're not being swallowed by death. You're being swallowed by life. That big, it just makes me think of uh, Jonah and the great fish, and he's swallowed, and it's like, well, I tell you what, he was drowning, and then the fish grabbed him, and had nothing worse than that, but then the fish vomits him out on dry land, so we will be vomited out in glory. I'm sure God wouldn't want to put it quite that way, but that's what happens. You are being swallowed by life. He who has prepared us, preparation, we're being prepared for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So therefore, we're always of good courage, or ought to be. And then finally, Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the church. And it can't be anything else. A bride adorned by God for her husband, coming down from heaven. So this is visual language. And here comes the bride adorned. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's the church. This is what God is doing by his spirit in the church. And what we were tempted to say is, I don't see it. That's fine. I'd look over there at the garden next in between my houses and the master gardener over there, and sometimes there's nothing. And I'm like, I don't walk away going, huh, I guess he don't know what he's doing anymore because I'm just waiting because I know something's going to pop up, and I'll just kind of walk over and go, what's that? He goes, oh, you want some of this? I was like, what is it? You know, and all kinds of stuff. So you don't see it. Doesn't mean God's not doing it. And he is building his church. Jesus Christ said, I'll build my church. And it is growing by his spirit. Today is not meaningless. It is working. An eternal way to glory. We are being grown into this. Rooted and grounded in love for strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, great is thy faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. Blessings all mine and ten thousands beside. Remind us when we feel you are not near that that's just our weak flesh lying to us. You are here in each of us, among us all. And one day, Oh, how bright and how clear and how glorious and fruitful it will all be. And always and forever, 
will be. Amen.